You're listening to the Dirt Pass Sermon Podcast, the podcast for the Ravenna Church of the Nazarene. I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, a.k.a. the Dirt Path Pastor, and my team and I strive to share the message of God's Word with you, seasoned with grace, laced with truth, and applying to your everyday life. Hey, I'm Pastor Jason, a.k.a. the Dirt Path Pastor. Uh, this episode of the Dirt Path Sermon Podcast is going to be a little bit different. Um, typically, it's the live recording of my weekly sermon at Ravenna Church of the Nazarene, or whoever's preaching that week, uh, converted to an audio file. And that's how we get the episode content. But today, we didn't have a live stream service uh, because we met at one of our church members' homes. And there's nothing wrong with our church. Everything's fine with the Ravnaz buildings. Um but we were celebrating the kickoff of football season together today. And so we met outdoors and we had a beautiful time of worship, an amazing time in the word together. And also, which is really important to the life of any group of believers is fellowship time with one another, just breaking bread. In this case, chicken wings and hamburgers and hot dogs and brats, right? That's what we broke together. So this is going to be the same message that I shared with the folks at Ravnas today, but it's going to be a little bit different than the live version. Uh, for for reasons that you would have to be there to completely understand. So this is the word that, this is going to be the word that God gave me to share today with the people around us, but also with you here on the Dirt Pastor Man podcast. I love football. My favorite thing to watch is football. When I play video games, I love football games. And it doesn't matter the level of football, whether it's flag football for like little kids or peewee football or middle school or high school, college. It doesn't matter. I love the game of football. In fact, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to graduate high school, go get a degree in education and teach history or, or, or English, and then coach football. And I actually, when I took a youth pastor job in, in Colorado, I was given the opportunity to coach freshman football, be part of, part of the coaching team. And I discovered as much as I love the game of football and I love coaching, I love Jesus more. And that's still true today. As much as I love football still, I still love Jesus more. It's, part, it's because Jesus loved me enough to lay down his life for me. So the least I can do is yield my life to him. I love watching Jesus work in the, in the midst of our worship services and seeing what happens when a group of people come together and, and yield to the Holy Spirit at work in the room. I love watching people in the congregation, seeing all of them worship Jesus. And that, that's the greatest encouragement to me as a pastor is seeing people fall in love with Jesus and worship him. And that kind of makes me think about the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. And the first commandment of the Ten Commandments is about loving God and worshiping, worshiping him. And nothing else. We cannot truly love God if we worship anyone or anything alongside him. And our passage today is about the links you and I must go to to worship God. So our text today is from Exodus chapter 23. I'm going to be reading verses 20 through 26. And it reads, I am going to send an angel before you to protect you on the way and bring you to the place I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to him. Do not defy him because he will not forgive your acts of rebellion, for my name is in him. But if you will carefully obey him and do everything I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. For my angel will go before you and bring you to the land of the Amorites, the Hithites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow and worship to their gods and do not serve them. 
Do not imitate their practices. Instead, demolish them and smash their sacred pillars to pieces. Serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your, bre bless your bread and bless your water. I will remove illnesses from you. No woman will miscarry or, or be childless in your land. I will give you the full numbers of your days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, here at the beginning of this message, it's, it's really important that I point this out. This word is a specific word for the children of Israel. God has freed them from Egypt, and now they're headed to the promised land. The promises in this chapter apply directly to them. While they apply directly to them, though, that does not mean there's not an application here for us. Because God has a word for us amid this specific promise to a specific people. Now, in verse 20, God says, I will send my angel before you. This angel is being sent to protect and lead the Israelites. And if you read ahead, you will... You, you, you will see that he does just that. He, he will go as a cloud by day and a pillar of, fire, pillar of fire by night. However, there's something peculiar about this angel. Verses 21 and 22 highlight an unusual amount of authority given to this angel. In this verse 21, God also makes, makes the statement, my name is in him. It's worded as if this angel is God himself. Now, many scholars believe this is the pre-incarnate Christ, or Jesus. Jesus before he, he became flesh in the New Testament, in the Gospels. If you read the book of Acts, later in the New Testament, after Jesus' death and resurrection, and the sending of the apostles, we, in, in Acts 9, you come across the story of, of Saul, who would become known as the Apostle Paul. This is his conversion story, and he's on the road to Damascus, he's on his way to persecute the church. When Jesus appears to him, but you remember how Jesus appears to him? It's in a bright light, just like this angel in Exodus will do leading the Israelites. If you go back to the Gospels and read the stories about when G the different accounts of when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says Jesus is, en Jesus is enveloped and a bright cloud of light lays on that mountain. And, and, and the, the uh, Peter, James, and John are witnessing this. Again, just like the angel in the book of Exodus. Now, in Matthew 17, verse 5, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew records this, saying, A voice is heard from the clouds, saying, This is my son whom I dearly love. I am very well pleased. I'm very pleased with him. But this is interesting. God also says, Listen to him. That last sentence echoes what God says in Exodus 23, verse 21 to the Israelites about the angel. Remember, he tells the Israelites, listen to him. What God is saying to the Israelites is the key to victory. The key to making it to the promised land for them is listening and obeying pre-incarnate Jesus. Their obedience to Jesus would lead them to success against all odds and obstacles they will face. In verse 21, God says to them, do not defy him because he will not forgive your acts of rebellion. Disobedience on their behalf would be because in their hearts, they do not love God. And if you do not love God, it is impossible to worship him. And if you don't worship God, then you cannot be forgiven. It's not that God can't forgive you. It's that your heart is not, it cannot, is not willing to receive the gift. Now, what's interesting is that their journey to the promised land would lead them to nations and cultures that do not love God. Matter of fact, these nations would be worshiping different gods and, and using their own unique practices to worship those gods. But God does not lead the Israelites away from these practices, but through the people practicing them. That's why in verse 24, God says, do not worship their gods, do not adopt their practices. God wanted the Israelites to worship him the way he commanded them to do so. And that begins with the Israelites worshiping God alone. And that would be evidenced, their worship of God would be evidenced by their obedience to him. 
And now it was not enough for them to go in and ignore the false worship that surrounded them. It, it, it wasn't just good enough to not worship those gods. It wasn't just it wasn't good enough to just not do the practices. No, the Israelites were to overthrow those gods and demolish the practices associated. This was a preventative measure for their worship of God. And, and it was also God revealing his greatness through their obedience to the cultures of the world and to the people in those cultures. Now, it's important to note that, that God's plan for his people has not changed. And I don't know that I fully understand why God is commanding the Israelites to do this military conquest in, in his name and wipe out these tribes. That seems foreign to us. That seems different to us in our culture now. But in a similar manner, we, we as the church... God has called us to be subversive through love for God and people. You and I, as, the, as followers of Jesus, uh, are to take the message of salvation through Jesus and, the, and, and live out the radical transformation that follows from that. And when we do that, that upends the ways of the world. We no longer conform to their patterns. And even though the times and methods are different, they're no less effective. And just like the Israelites, our key to victory with Jesus is based on our deep love for God. Verses 25 and 26 show how God will be faithful to the Israelites if they listen and obey. God will provide for their needs and God will protect them from enemies and elements they encounter. Now again, these promises are specific to the Israelites as they journey through the wilderness to the promised land. And you and I now, today, we know godly people in our lives who struggle. But even in the midst of our struggles, though, we do, we do have Jesus as our bread of life. Jesus as our living water. And we have this promise of everlasting life. While the Israelites were called to be obedient, these promises were conditional based on their performance. This does not mean God's faithfulness to us or to them is based on performance. God is good and, God, and does good things out of love. Rather, obedience is an outward evidence of trusting God. And trust is a foundational element in love. If you don't trust someone, you can't love them fully. If you, if, if you are in a relationship where you cannot trust the person, then you need to get out of the relationship. Because it's not healthy. So if we love God, we're going to trust him. And our obedience is, is evidence of that. Performance matters not because it obligates God to move on our behalf, but because it reveals our heart for God. And that's what it would reveal about the Israelites if they heard and obeyed God's voice. Now, these words were spoken by God and were, and were shared with the people of God, not the world. That's actually why when I read the, the text, why I always end with that statement, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's reminding us that we are followers of Jesus, we belong to God. The word revealed was given to us to, to study so we can begin to know and understand God and his ways better and therefore live it out in our lives. It was given to God's people, not to hoard to ourselves, but to share it. And the most effective way we share it is by living it out. As a matter of fact, that's what, what God's word is to the world. God's word to the world is his people living out their love for him. And the application of this passage is not for the world, but for us, the followers of Jesus. This is to be a group project, a group project of the church universal. 
And the only way we can do this collectively together as the church is if you and I accept this truth personally and live it out. You and I are called to worship God only. Now, while the Israelites were called to trust in the pre-incarnate Christ, we have the revelation of God incarnate. Jesus is God in the flesh who died on the cross and rose again so everyone could be forgiven and set free from sin. We believe that Jesus is our everything. Because of what Jesus did to demonstrate God's love to us, we love Jesus by listening to him and living our lives in obedience to him. We don't do it out of fear. We're not doing it to, because of the prize. That's a, that's a bonus. We're doing it because we love God. Now, just as Jesus is for us, that's why God came and sent him to die on the cross. It was, it was because Jesus is for us. He's for our salvation. He's for our forgiveness. He's for our redemption. He's for our transformation into who God created us to be. And just as Jesus is for us, we are for Jesus. We're not against anyone. But we're no longer we but we no longer live subject to the patterns of this world. The things the world chases or worships, we do not because Jesus is greater. To truly love Jesus and live in obedience to him, we must do away with the world in us. And if we do away with the world in us and live our lives for Jesus, our lives will go into the world and expose the idols the world holds dear. And it'll demonstrate where they fall short in comparison to Jesus. If you and I live our lives in obedience to him. Now, the idols of our world today are not so much physical objects as they were in the Old Testament. Today's idols are ideas the world believes will make them happy. And, and they demonstrate this by their actions and their desires. We are being sent out by Jesus with the power of the Holy Spirit to topple these things. And to be clear, again, we're, we're not against people or even their practices. We are for Jesus. We, sometimes we get that confused. We begin to look at people and exclude them and speak down to them. We, we get stuck in the mindset of it's us versus them. But that's not the truth. We are, Jesus is for them. And since Jesus is for them, we are for them. Because we are for Jesus. The church is so much for Jesus that we choose him over these other things that others use to take his place. And that's what makes us different. That's what sets us apart. That's what the Holy Spirit helps us achieve. Now, there are idols that we need to reject in our hearts and minds to demonstrate our faith in Jesus. And our faith in Jesus will challenge the world's, cl the world's claims about these things. And the first, idol, the first idol that the world chases is pleasure. People seek activities that feel good physically and give their brains temporary feelings of happiness. The trouble is they come back to reality and they must seek pleasure again. But we are for Jesus. He invites us to cast our anxieties on him and to trust him with our burdens. Yes, we're not against pleasurable things. We do pleasurable things. But those things are bonuses to the joy already in our hearts. We, our, our lives are not dependent upon those pleasurable things to make us feel happy for a brief time. No, we have joy that unspeakable and full of glory in our hearts because we have the Holy Spirit. We have faith in Jesus. The second idol of the world is entertainment. Music and movies are used to escape life and to see a false definition of good triumphing over evil. This gives hope that evil can be overcome but unfortunately, this hope only exists in a fantasy land or a place far from where they are. But we are for Jesus and we don't need distractions. He is God who is good and who has overcome evil. That is our daily and everlasting reality. Again, it's not that we're against music. It's not that we're against movies. 
but we wash them simply to enjoy them. Not looking for a distraction, not looking for hope in them. Our hope is in Jesus. The third idol of the world is money. They believe if they can have all the money, all their problems are gone, and they can have the means to fulfill all their desires. And if all their desires are fulfilled, then they will be happy, and so will their family. But unfortunately, more money equals more problems with more to lose. But we are for Jesus. Money has a place, but Jesus is our desire, and and we trust that he will provide all that we need. Again, money itself is not evil. It's the love of money that causes us to do crazy and terrible things. But we're for Jesus. The fourth idol of the world is success. It feels good to win. It feels good to reach the top. When When we accomplish something, it brings praise. It brings promotions and it brings a whole bunch more things. However, the problem is if we worship success and we, we're constantly chasing after success for to determine our value and to make ourselves feel good. The problem is we live in a world where a bigger fish always comes along. But see, we as followers of Jesus, we're for Jesus. And success to us is glorifying God. See, see many of you would look at this podcast or, or my church and and determine whether I was successful by the, by the number of people in the pews or, or how many downloads the podcast has. That's not the way I see it. That's not success to me. Success to me is glorifying God. It's not that others don't matter. But we don't seek validation from them. God loves us. God is proud of us. And that's what propels us to keep going. What propels me to keep doing these things is seeing the transformation that's taking place when people hear the word of Jesus, place their faith in him, and then allow his Holy Spirit to work in their hearts and minds. That's success to me. And that's not a number. That's a person being set free. That's a person being reborn. That's a person finding freedom and living in it. That's a person who was hopeless now having hope and living in the joy of that hope. That's success. Success from the kingdom of God. What brings glory to God is when somebody who is one way doesn't 180. And yes, they may not be running in the new direction. They may be crawling. They may be taking a breath, but that's a, that's that's something. That's progress. That's the transformation of the Holy Spirit taking on their lives. That's that's success. And according to the kingdom. And that brings glory to God. The fifth idol of the world is security. They seek weapons. They seek armies. They seek conformity in thinking. And they seek control because they, they think if we just have enough weapons, if we just have the biggest army, if we can just convince everybody to think our way, if we could just control everything, then there will be peace. And we'll be safe. But for some reason, evil always seems to find a way to take what is meant for protection and use it for cruelty. Think about even even the church has been guilty of this, right? We 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 take what's meant for good, what's meant for safety and security, and in Jesus, and we weaponize it. We use it as as a cruel weapon against other people. Our human hearts are susceptible to taking up cruelty in the name of peace. But see, what we don't realize is when we achieve our peace. Through those worldly means, those means that are not God honoring, are, are not according to God's ways. It's yes, we may have peace, but we've got we've achieved our peace by robbing somebody else of theirs, and that's not the way of God's kingdom. We are for Jesus; He is our peace. We are not against guns or armies. Or things, things of protection have their place; security has its place. But in the end, we're not counting on our stockpile of weapons when Jesus returns to save us. Jesus wins. He is our peace. He is our safety. He's going, and he doesn't need our guns to win the battle at the end. He has the word of his mouth. 
He has an army with him, but he doesn't need the army. He doesn't force us to conform to his ways. He gives us the free will to choose for ourselves. God's not seeking to control us. God is seeking for us us to realize how much he loves us and then to reciprocate that love by us choosing with our free will to live our lives for him. A life that loves God and loves others. We are for Jesus. That's what we're for. We're for the peace that comes with Jesus. The sixth idol of the world is routine. They think routines are what will sustain happiness. But the problem with routines is they get disrupted by job changes, family changes. Think about it. You, you develop your, your morning routine and you have this one favorite coffee shop that you want to go to every day, that you stop and you have a cup of coffee. That's how you get your day going. And then you, then you, you move on from there. But one day that coffee shop closes. Or you have a, your favorite cheeseburger place. And you go there day after day for lunch, and that's where you get your cheese. But all of a sudden, they, they, they take that one cheese where you, you, you like most, and they take it off the menu. See, if our happiness is based on routines, it's always going to be disrupted, and our happiness is always going to be robbed because we live in a world that's constantly changing. But see, you and I, as followers of Jesus, we're for Jesus. Because Jesus is God, and Jesus is the God who never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In this world of constant change that is chaos around us, Jesus is our one constant thing, our one sustaining anchor in the waves of life. And as long as we have that anchor down, we're a boat on the waves, and we're being, we'll be tossed by the wind and the waves, but we're not going anywhere. Our boats might get battered, think sails might get torn, boards might get broken, we might get a little bit of water in the cabin. But we will be steadfast and sure. We will hold steady because Jesus holds us in place. He is our foundation. He is our anchor. He is our everything. In the last... There are a lot more idols than this, and I, but I'm trying to limit it to seven. And the last one I want to mention is the past. We worship, the world worships the past. They, they think if things could just go back to the way they were before, then the good times will return. But there's a problem. There's actually two problems. First off, they're looking back at the past through rose-colored glasses, forgetting the struggle and the difficulties that made those good times great. Well, on the other side of that is the problem is time never goes backward. It always moves forward. But you and I, we are for Jesus. And Jesus' victory is now. His work is complete, and it's being completed in us as we wait for his kingdom to fully arrive. We're assured of, of the victory. We have that victory in our hearts and our minds now, but we know at some point Jesus is going to return, and that victory is going to be fully revealed, and we're going to be fully participating in it. That, that part of the victory, that fullness, is awaiting us when Jesus comes back. And that's in the future. It's not in the past. And for you and I to get to that moment is going to require us living in the victory of Jesus now in the midst of the chaos. We can't look back and long to go back to where it was before. That's what the Israelites are going to do on this journey. As they're wandering through the wilderness, they're going to look back at times when it gets hard and say, well, if we could, you know, it was a lot better in Egypt, forgetting how, how miserable they were. And the links that God had to go to, to to find their freedom for them. They forget all that. No, God's calling us to live in his victory now. Moving forward to the, the promises that he has for us. We're for Jesus. If you're listening today, if, if you're clinging to one of these idols, 
that go and follow Jesus. Deep down, you know this. He is what you're truly seeking. He's what you're missing. He's what... They're using one of these idols to try and take his place, but but they're not doing a sustaining job. They're, they're, they, they can't fill it because they, 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 they're not Jesus. Jesus is truly what you're seeking. Now, if you're clinging to Jesus as you're listening to this, worship him in spirit and live out truth. You doing this will challenge the world's idols. And maybe even top even topple them in hearts through his transformational love. Living for the kingdom of Jesus is not us intentionally walking out and picking fights with people that are different than us, who see things different than us. And so many times to when we or when we go out and we try to topple the idols of the world, it's not so much even entering debates about why God's real and who Jesus really is. You know, the real way to win to, to show people the love of Jesus is by us living it out, by us showing kindness. By us just being uniquely different through the Holy Spirit in us than what the world does. If you want to topple idols, put down the battle weapons. If you want to smash the practices of the world to pieces, you don't need a hammer. What you need is faith in Jesus and live out the power of his Holy Spirit. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Burt Passman Podcast. It was recorded live at the Ravenna Church of the Nazarene, located at 530 Main Street in Ravenna, Kentucky. You can learn more about the Ravenna Church of the Nazarene by visiting ravnaz.com. And if you'd like to send me a message, just simply use the link in the show notes.